again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Odyssey House Journals. I'm Randall Carlisle. Uh, my usual co-host, Rachel Santizo, is home in bed sick. So uh, we, we wish Rachel well. I have a very special guest today, Dr. Amy De La Garza, and, and I'm honored to have you here because you are a doctor, and I, I guess maybe I should ask you first of all, who focuses a lot of attention on addiction and recovery. Uh, you could have been a wealthy plastic surgeon and helped fix the wrinkles in my neck and, <laughs> and charge a lot of money. Why did you choose to focus on, on addiction and recovery? Um, that's a very interesting story. Um, it was totally by accident, actually. Um, my plan was to be a rich um, facial plastic surgeon. Okay. Um, I'm Fixing my neck and my yep. face. Yes. And it's so I mean, it's just so ironic that you say that because I initially matched in a head and neck surgery program here really? at the U. Yeah. And my goal was to do cleft palates and then facial plastic surgery. Um, but for lots of different reasons, three children being the primary reasons, that didn't work out. Um, and so... I took about five years off from medicine to take care of three tiny really? kids. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think I would ever go back, honestly. Um, but I got pretty tired of being at home with three small children. <laughs> um, and I'd already gone to medical school and, like, right. you know, done a whole general surgery internship. And so I ended up getting really lucky and getting a spot at St. Mark's Family Medicine um, to do family practice. And because I had already done a year of general surgery, right when I started family practice, I was able to prescribe controlled substances. And so, because usually you have to have a year of training before you can do that. Right. And so I had already had my year of training. And so when I got to St. Mark's Family Medicine, Paula Cook was leaving, um, Pat Green was leaving, Darlene Peterson had just left, all great addiction medicine providers um, in our state. And... Um, everybody was like, these patients are not going to have anyone to treat them because no one will be available to provide buprenorphine because no one else wanted to do it. Literally, no one else wanted to do it in wow. our group. And I was like, well, that sounds like a big drag. I'll do it. You know, I'll get wavered and do it. And um, so I got my buprenorphine, my ex waiver, and I just sort of jumped in. And um, you know Matt Anderson? Do you know Matt no. Anderson? No. Um, Anyway, Matt Anderson was our Vivitrol rep at the time, and um, we had a really nice Suboxone rep at the time, and they just sort of brought me into the circle, and Paula Cook and um, Pat Green and Darlene all sort of mentored me in how to start taking care of people, and I just fell in love with the population, and I've just been doing it ever since, and um, I have, you know personal family struggles with addiction. Um, I think everyone does. Yeah. And um, which became clear the longer I was in practice. And so that sort of, I think, fueled my, I was always compassionate, but that certainly lended more to sure. my compassion. Um, and, you know, I think well, we're glad we all have struggles, you yes. know, like, yeah. so it really was totally accidental and was the best thing that ever happened to me. So I'm glad yeah. you're working on people's uh, addiction as opposed to my neck, okay? Me too, you're man. You're doing a lot more. I might be a lot more. I might not have very much money, but it sure is rewarding. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, for those of you watching, the substances she was referring to that she was able to prescribe as part of a, a treatment program are all considered medication-assisted treatment, right? Like Vivitrol and buprenorphine, Suboxone, and those are all uh, considered the gold standard of treating uh, people with an addiction. Yeah, we don't. Um, we don't. We've, we're sort of moving away from the medication-assisted treatment um, concept for a lot of different reasons. Um, Suboxone, buprenorphine. Um, and Vivitrol, we primarily, for opioid use disorder, we're primarily calling medications for opioid use disorder now, okay. so MOUD. Um, and then other medications for alcohol use disorder, any other type of treatment, um, we're just calling medications to assist in recovery. Um, and 
it's semantics, but these, that's these just, things change all they the change time. all the time. But I think it's worth mentioning. Um, and these really are the evidence-based medical treatments um, in conjunction with all the behavioral health treatments that we do to treat people with with substance use disorder. So, you're yeah. you're in private practice, uh, and and I think I I read I was I I looked you up. Uh, you can you can in, in case you want to get a hold of Amy, all you got to do is Google Dr. Amy D E L A G A R Z A, right? Yeah, and, but I've just moved, actually. Oh, I've moved, moved so, to so a new Google, company. So Google's wrong now? Yeah. So you got to change that. I know. I know. I do have a website, but it's no, I am no longer in private practice. So I've actually just moved to a new company. Um, it's called Cedar Psychiatry or NovaMind. Um, NovaMind is our parent company now. Um, we've essentially merged, but... We're still considered Nova Mind and Cedar Psychiatry. So, what kinds of things services do you offer? So, it's really interesting. Um, Cedar Psychiatry offers a you know an entire range of behavioral health services. Um, I've been hired by Nova Mind to develop their outpatient substance use disorder program, and then I provide care at our Salt Lake City downtown clinic. I'm the medical director there. Um, so, we provide a whole host of behavioral health, therapy, medications. We have psychiatrists, PAs, NPs, um, and a whole host of therapists. Um, but then NovaMind, the parent company, um, is, is a company which is investing in phase two and phase three trials for psychedelic medicine. So MDMA, ketamine, and psilocybin. And so part magic of magic mushrooms. Yes, yes. magic mushrooms. Yeah. So part of my role will be, um, and already has been, um, to really start thinking about how do we um, continue research um, using psychedelic medicine for people with substance use disorder. Um, and so that there are a few things going on right now, but hopefully in the future. Um, working with people who are already doing some of this type of work, um, NYU, Johns Hopkins, um, will be able to start developing some studies to look at how psychedelic medicine can help people with this in our population. You've so. observed this, I presume. So we're talking ketamine, MDMA is also known as ecstasy, uh, and psycho, what, psilocybin. psilocybin mushrooms yeah. are known as magic mushrooms. Mm -hmm. Have you seen... And you've, how, how are they used in treatment for substance use disorder? They're really not yet. Um, so historically... Ketamine is. Ketamine is. And, I, and I'll talk about a couple of studies um, in just a minute. But, um, you know, historically, LSD and psilocybin back in the 50s and 60s um, were used primarily to treat people with alcohol use disorder with very good outcomes. Um, but because of the Controlled Substances Act and President Nixon um, in the 60s, that, that all stopped. All of that research stopped very abruptly. And a lot of the use of the substances went underground. And we're just now seeing a resurgence of, of some of this um, research, um, primarily um, because of a few very committed individuals um, who have really sort of pushed for this, uh, for a resurgence in this research. And so um, more recently, um, the use of psilocybin has been primarily for people with end-stage cancer, existential crisis and depression in people with end-stage cancer. That's a lot of that work has been done at Johns Hopkins. Um, there is a, a doctor, Elias Dockwar, at, um, he works New York University, I think, NYU. I may be wrong about that, so I'm okay. sorry. Um, but he has done the, the primary studies on ketamine and alcohol use disorder. And then um, a psychedelic um, research company called Awaken um, has just published a new study about ketamine and alcohol use disorder with favorable results. So these are small studies. Um, 
not very many patients. They're randomized, they're controlled. Um, this last study from Awaken was a very good study showing promising effects of, of ketamine in conjunction with um, mindfulness-based behavioral treatments for reducing alcohol use, for improving alcohol use disorder outcomes. Which would be like, when you say mindfulness-based, it'd be like a program like Odyssey House or... Yes, this is a very manualized protocol that was developed by one of the researchers okay. that did the study. So it's very specific to that study. Okay. But um, of course, we can we can extrapolate. We sure. can use other mindfulness based techniques. And my hope is to do a study through Cedar Research, Cedar Clinical Research, looking at the use of ketamine in a group setting. Um, using mindfulness-based techniques. Okay, that's my hope. We'll see how we do. Um, this is this is controversial, though, right? It's very controversial Con- because society yeah. says, uh, oh, "Wait a minute, you're going to talk about giving somebody magic mushrooms or ecstasy or something to solve a, pro- a, 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 a some kind of chemical addiction problem? That it doesn't make sense." Yeah, I think the good news about specifically about psilocybin and ketamine um, is that they have a very low addictive potential. So, like, if you look at um, the addictive potential of alcohol or um, heroin heroin or fentanyl (laughs) compared to ketamine or psilocybin, alcohol is up, you know, at the top, and ketamine and psilocybin are at the bottom. There are potential problems more so with ketamine than psilocybin, um, for developing a use disorder. But on the grand scale of things, ketamine is pretty low on the addiction spectrum. Um, But we do have to be really careful, and that's why I'm so excited about the work at CEDAR, um, is because they are really committed to doing the research and applying the research. And not having it be something that's like, I mean, between you and I, I think the ketamine situation in our valley is quite disheartening. Um, A lot of people with substance use disorder are ending up in ketamine clinics. um, And they're not getting urine drug screens and they're not, nobody's checking the controlled substance database. No one really has any idea. These providers don't have anything they have no idea what's going on with their patients, basically, is what I'm saying. And um, and people are ending up in trouble. And that's why I'm so happy to be where I am at, at Cedar um, and Nova Mind is because I there's a lot of support for doing it the right way um, and trying to get some good evidence so that we can treat this very vulnerable population in the safest way that we can and not marketing ketamine as sort of the next catch-all um, for treating addiction because that is not what it is. So if somebody sees it, because there's a lot of ads out there right now for ketamine therapy. Yes, there and is. And there's new clinics opening, it looks like, all the time. Every second, it yeah. seems. So mm-hmm. if, if I'm a recovering alcoholic, uh, been clean for 10 years, uh, and, and a couple of drugs helped me in, in the beginning, yeah. I, I did ant abuse because I didn't because it scared me and so it scared me away from drinking. Yeah. And then the other was, um, oh, what's the drug that's in Vivitrol? Uh, naltrexone. Yeah, I did. I took naltrexone pills. Yeah. Uh, and it worked. You yeah. know, maybe because I was scared I'd get sick as hell if I drank on ant abuse. Yeah. Uh, but so there is there there is something there. But if I would have seen an ad back when I was thinking of recovery. Yeah. That all I have to do is go in and get high uh, with a substance like ketamine, and you'll be okay. Uh, I might have done that. So, what should people watch for if they're thinking about this as 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 one method of recovery? Well, I don't think we have any clear cut answers on that yet. Like we, there's no data that says if you have a substance use disorder only use ketamine if you have, you know, been abstinent from your substance of choice for this many months, you know, like we just, we don't have that kind of data yet. Um, You know, I was like busily sending an email right before we got onto this call or onto this um, 
podcast. podcast. <laughs> um, one of the emails that I was sending was, I'm going to have a meeting today at 1130 with Dr. Paul Carlson up at the University of Utah, who runs their ketamine for um, treatment resistant depression program, um, because I am working very hard t- to put together a standard operating procedure for Cedar Psychiatry, for Cedar Clinical Research, Nova Mind. <laughs> how do we do this responsibly? And, you know, up at the U, they have a certain amount of time that they like people to be abstinent from substances before they'll treat them with ketamine for major depressive disorder only. Let me make that very clear. That's all they're doing at the U. Um, And they have to have clean, you know, not clean. They have to have, you know, urine drug screens that are expected. Um, And they follow them very closely. So I'm in the process of putting together that SOP for the work that we're going to be doing with people with substance use disorder. And and I don't know where I'm going to fall yet. I We haven't decided. But I think that being in stable recovery for at least a certain amount of time, whether it's six months or 12 months, I don't really know what I'm, what I've decided yet is key. And then taking it on a patient by patient basis, what's your recovery capital look like? What does your life look like right now? How safe and secure are you in your space of recovery before we add something that we're not, we're not exactly sure what it's going to do. So you're to doing, your brain. You're doing this responsibly you know? is what you're saying. Well, that's my job. Like my job as an addiction medicine doctor is to take care of patients in the best way that I can, the safest way that I can, and to help the community understand that there's there's no there's no magic bullet for this, right? Like no. Vivitrol's not the magic bullet, Suboxone's not the magic bullet. It can't, there's no magic bullet for this. It's complicated. It's multifactorial. It's devastating. It's challenging. Um, and we have to be really careful how we, how, how we do this because ketamine, psilocybin, all of these psychedelic medicines, it's like all I hear every day from my patients is, do you think mushrooms would help me? (laughs) You know, and, and I can't, I can't say that with integrity right now. You know, and so, um, yeah, I think I think we have to be really careful. What I like about your approach is the fact that there, like you said, there's no magic bullet. Because if there was, <laughs> if you owned the magic bullet, you'd be a billionaire. I wouldn't have to be a facial plastic surgeon, <laughs> no, that's for no, sure. <laughs> uh, and and what I like about you is that you're considering all alternatives. It's, as you said, addiction is a lifelong complicated disease and there is no one answer. And one of the reasons I, I, I got to know you is because you did a little, uh, you did an experiment at, <laughs> at Odyssey House that I had never thought of before and it, and it worked. Uh, can you, and this is just another alternative, not a drug, but acupuncture. Describe that. Yeah. So in 2019, um, Dr. Beth Howell um, up at the U um, trained a bunch of us in um, the NADA protocol. Um, She didn't train us, but she brought in a trainer, Libby Stout, who's a psychiatrist from Colorado, um, trained us in the National Acupuncture Detoxification Association protocol, or NADA. Um, It is acupuncture because we use acupuncture needles, but I try to be very sensitive to calling it acupuncture. Um, We call it AccuDetox. So it's five needles in each ear. Um, And it was developed historic, the historical um, sort of concept of NADA started back in the 60s and 70s um, with the Black Panthers and the, um, they, and at the Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx. and the Young Lords, Black Panthers and the Young okay. Lords. So actually, um, Dr. Shakur, um, Tupac Shakur's stepfather, okay. um, actually started this movement using AccuDetox for people who were withdrawing from methadone um, and also from, from heroin. Wow. And so he basically set up a peer support training program in the heart of the Bronx Um, and when the Young Lords took over Lincoln Hospital, um, they developed an 
basically an outpatient peer support harm reduction addiction treatment clinic, okay. which was incredibly forward thinking for that time, sure. you know, and, um, they trained people in recovery and other peer support to develop Accu detox to basically anyone who came in the door. Um, and then fast forward into the, into the eighties, I I'm not sure of all the dates, but fast forward into the eighties and nineties, a, a psychiatrist named Michael Smith basically developed the National Acupuncture Detoxification Association to provide training um, in this protocol to include in treatment um, for, for patients with addiction. And he basically made NADA what it is today, a nonprofit organization who focuses on advocacy and training in the NADA protocol to, to treat people with substance use disorder, to pe treat people um, who have experienced a significant traumatic event. So this was used at Ground Zero for first responders and people in the neighborhoods in New York um, at, during 9-11, the aftermath of 9-11. It's been used Hurricane Katrina. It's now being used for frontline healthcare workers, for first responders, um, because it so beautifully reduces the stress response right in the moment, so, right in the moment. So what did you do at Odyssey? It was amazing. So Paula Cook started it. She um, started doing auricular acu detox in the orientation units during at the beginning of COVID. Um, she and another um, psychiatry resident from the U. And the psychiatry resident quickly became too busy and wasn't able to continue it. And so I was doing my fellowship in addiction medicine up at the U. Um, and Paula said, what, would you be able to help me? <laughs> you know, like we have all these people to treat. I can't do it by myself. And so for eight months of my fellowship, um, I treated people first with Paula and the orientation units and the response was so amazing um, that then I went to Lighthouse, to one of the adult houses downtown, um, and I did about 100, 80 to 100 treatments twice a week for eight months. Um, now these are people in residential care at Odyssey uh, dealing with a number of substance use disorders. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And at the time, well, I, I don't know if it's still like this now, but at the time it was the heart of COVID, right? right. So everybody was broken into cohorts, um, eight to 10 people spaced throughout the house. Right. You know, it was, it was very stressful. Sure. Um, in and a I, situation that's already stressful oh, enough. It yeah. was just like, it was 10 people packed into a tiny little room. Yeah all day together doing really difficult work, sure, right? Like this sure. work is so hard for people. And um, a lot of irritability, a lot of anxiety, a lot of frustration. <laughs> What'd you say? No, no. Yeah, 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 I mean, it was, it was so intense. Like my compassion for those humans in that situation was, yeah, it was a lot. Um, so I would come in on Tuesdays and Thursdays and I would just go around to each cohort, put needles in. Um, the way the protocol is supposed to be delivered is in a group. Um, I would put everybody's needles in and then they would listen to calming meditative type right. music or actually do a, a guided meditation. Um, and then I would take all the needles out and it took me about four hours. So I would spend about eight hours a week um, doing these treatments and we collected data. So we had them fill out a survey before their treatment and after their treatment, and we looked at um, withdrawal symptoms, craving, irritability, triggers, anxiety, yeah. and sleep did we do? Oh my gosh, Randall, I'm so embarrassed now. No, I'm no, forgetting the but five points. But we basically looked at... Um, how did it make them feel? Be how did they feel before versus how did they feel after? And and everybody felt better for the most part. There were a few people that didn't like it, um, but the data that we sort of accumulated, we had seventy six people who had done at least two treatments. So our N was seventy six, and um, oh, now I remember what it was. So it was withdrawal, craving, irritability anxiety and motivation for treatment. So um, anxiety decreased, irritability decreased, 
withdrawal decreased, craving decreased, and motivation for treatment increased. Right. So we didn't actually collect data on retention because that was just too challenging. Sure. But anecdotally, there were so many patients that said to Paula and to myself and to everybody work Adam Cohen, everybody that was yeah. working with them, this is one of the primary reasons I kept my butt in the seat and stayed. Because we, I knew someone was, I knew Amy was going to show up to do this for me. We had a guest on last week, Stephen Moore. Oh, who, yes. Who credits that with why he stayed in the program. And, and, yeah. and, and a lot of other people that he <laughs> stayed in the program with him saying, you know, because you can walk out of an Odyssey treatment program anytime you want. Yeah. And the first 30 days are pretty significant, getting used to the rules and everything else. And a lot of people stayed in just because of that. Yep. Yeah, it was probably the most, um, I sort of get emotional still when I talk about it, especially when I talk about Stephen. Um, it was probably the most meaningful thing I've done in my professional career yet. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was really, really meaningful. You're tearing up. It was amazing. I mean, you know, I, I to when I testified um, for the Senate, for our hearing for our bill a couple of weeks ago, I really thought very hard about what I wanted to say because I only had one to two minutes right. to say it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as physicians, especially, I think, people who treat behavioral health and substance use, it can be really challenging sometimes to feel like we're doing anything. Because you right? see a lot of failure. There's yeah. a lot of failure. And when you're sitting across the table from someone who's hurting in this way, sometimes there's just nothing to do. You know, like, there's nothing to do but say, I'm sorry, and I empathize with what you're going through. How can I help you? Mm -hmm. You know? And that doesn't always feel like enough. Like, it, it just doesn't, right? If I sit down with a patient who is really activated, whether they're sad, whether they're irritable, whether they're panicking, whether they're hopeless or helpless, if I say, do you want to, can I put some acupuncture needles in? <laughs> how, how do you feel about that? You know? And most of the time people are so desperate, they say yes. You know? And after they sit for 30 minutes, really without exception, I mean, there are exceptions to every rule, but really without exception, people feel better right there in the moment. And to be able to relieve suffering like that, right, <laughs> right then, and to see that response and to experience that therapeutic connection that I'm able to make with someone like that in the moment is, I, I've never experienced it as a provider. And I've been practicing medicine in one form or another for since I was a med student, right? right? So for 20 or more years. And so that's what I said at my Senate testimony. I was like, listen, this is a, this is something that, this is a tool in my toolbox that I've never had before. And it works instantly in the moment to relieve suffering. And I, I don't know what else to say. We only have a minute or two left. And, and one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is because you and a bunch of other people were responsible for changing the law in the legislature yeah. and, and it, as it deals with this acupuncture issue. To, tell us about the new law. House Bill 195. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you um, know. <laughs> we um, have been working on this for a couple of years. Um, Dr. Howell, myself, Dr. Cook, um, Dr. Stout in Colorado, uh, an attorney named Charles Pyle in, Col in Arizona, um, who all work for NADA, um, and then some amazing acupuncturists. So Laura Berglund, Hannah Dortman, Chris Rogers, um, Bea Hammond, Kristen Phipps. 
they were acupuncturists that were very supportive of what we did. And so we all worked together as a group. Um, and if I'm forgetting anyone, I'm so sorry. Oh, Stephen Moore. Stephen Moore was, um, he was the magic bullet for this bill, okay. I think. Um, we all worked together. And what we did in, in Utah, the only people that can be trained in NADA right now are, well, not anymore, but doctors, DOs, chiropractors, and licensed acupuncturists. Okay. Those are the only people that can be trained. And like I just said, it took me eight hours a week to treat 100 people in one residential house in Odyssey. Right. Right? That's like a drop in the bucket. Sure. For how many people in this state that could benefit from that type of intervention. True. So for just doctors, acupuncturists, chiropractors, and DOs to be the ones doing it, we'll never have enough boots on the ground. You won't have enough. We and, won't and have enough boots on the ground. agencies can't afford it either. And agencies can't afford it. Right. So in other states in the country, um, mental health workers, nurse practitioners, PAs, nurses, psychologists have been able to be trained in NADA to deliver it as part of treatment as usual. So it's not something that's done separate from treatment. It's all embedded in treatment. Um, and so that was our goal, was to be able to expand um, the ability to get trained and add on um, providing the NADA protocol to your license um, to all of these different groups in Utah. And uh, Suzanne Harrison, Dr. Suzanne Harrison, she's an anesthesiologist, um, she took up this fight for us. And um, she... she I mean, without her, we wouldn't have done this. So I'm so grateful to Suzanne but, um, and all the people that we worked with. But um, it passed 66 to 2, I think, through the House. I think those were the numbers. Um, and then it passed unanimously through the Senate on three readings. Wow. And so starting, I believe it's in May. I don't have the official date. Um, but this will be the new law in Utah. Um, mental health workers of all kinds, um, psychologists, nurse practitioners, PAs, and all nurses, including CRNAs, will be able to obtain the NADA training and um, add it to their license. Oh, and the other person I should mention is Larry Marks from Doppel. He was very helpful in, in helping me think about this language, and he was just very supportive of us. Um, and so all of us together as a team did this, and it's absolutely amazing. And um, Dr. Howell and myself will be going to Pueblo um, in at the end of April to do our first trainer training. So that you can train so people So that we here. can train people. And then we're hoping at the beginning of the summer, sometime at the beginning of June, maybe July, um, Dr. Stout, Beth, and myself – um, we'll have the first training um, here in Utah for mental health workers. That's exciting. And, yeah, and it's that, amazing. Well, and what that means is that it could become part of our regular treatment program at places like Odyssey Absolutely. or any other treatment program. Yep. And we wouldn't have to bring in outsiders to do this because it would be part of the program. Yep. And Adam... Cohen has been, oh, I mean, he's another, per, I he's, mean, Adam he, he, testified. He's Odyssey CEO, by the way. He's Odyssey CEO. He has, he was supportive of acupuncture sure. at Odyssey from the get-go with Dr. Cook and myself. And Adam testified for us throughout the entire process. He was a huge support. Um, he was another magic bullet, I think, for us <laughs> um, because he's so well-known, you yeah. know. Um, and... Yeah, we'll be able to train providers, mental health workers here at Odyssey House so that this can be delivered in the moment every day like it should be. And that's a huge win. It is a huge win. Thank you so much for yeah. fighting fighting so hard for that. Uh, and it'll, it, it'll make a huge difference at, at all treatment programs. Now, we're, we, we're not trying to just push Odyssey here, yeah. but, but anybody will be able to get training to be able to administer that in a program. So yep. I, yeah. my hat's off to you. Thank you for yeah. focusing on the substance use disorder problem as opposed to my neck. I appreciate <laughs> that. Very, yes. I'll, I'll keep my wrinkles. And I you can, can refer you to someone really yeah, I'm sure good. You can. <laughs> Dr. Amy De La Garza was our guest. 
Uh, you can Google her, look, check out her website, and she'll update where she is if you want to seek out treatment from her. And she's done so much for the recovery community. So thank you very much. Thank you for watching another edition of Odyssey House Journals.